President Bustin to my left, uh, I, I'm, as you, you know, I'm, I'm going to be new at Bard in August, and so I took the opportunity to look at your Wikipedia uh, oh, site. Um, Only my son does that. Uh, well, and I, I did know that you were characterized first as a conductor uh, and second as the president of Bard College, but I'm, I'm sure that was just the choice of the editor. Um, but uh, certainly suggestive of, of the multidimensional um, history. Um, and it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to be working with you over, over the coming I'm years. I'm more pleased that you're coming than you should be pleased that I'm here. Well, <laughs> I don't, I, well, uh, our, our second guest is, um, is Andy Revkin, who is uh, the premier science journalist in the United States. He's the writer for the New York Times. Uh, is, that, is that a fair characterization, Andy? So, sure, why yeah, not? Yeah. Um, before, before being at the Times, uh, he had written uh, for Discover Magazine uh, on the west coast of the Los Angeles Times. Um, and uh, we're just very pleased. To, he's, he's been associated with the Bard Center over the years, and we're very pleased to have him back. Um, so I, wanted, I really wanted to start out our conversation today. I, the, earlier in my remarks, I, I I suggested that, at least in my own thinking, that, uh, that I've sort of been transformed over the last 10 or 15 years by uh, the magnitude of the challenge that young people face today, and in our generation, as was pointed out earlier. Um, when I was in college and thinking about environmental issues, it, it was really f framed as a debate between sort of a neo-Malthusian perspective that too many people, too much consumption in a world of constrained resources, as opposed, as against a cornucopian view that technology will ultimately see us through, and that uh, I certainly grew up with a sense that 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 if we could properly manage the next 30 or 40 years, we could make it through under more or less a business as usual scenario. That you know uh, that that management was going to be adequate, and that's sort of what we needed. Um, but beginning uh, really in 2006 with Jim Hansen's declaration that, that really we had 10 years to get our act together, I think he really crystallized a perspective that, uh, that business as usual is no longer an option and that in fact uh, layered on to these conventional, if you will, Malthusian concerns about population consumption against global resource shortages, we now have this deadline that nature has set uh, uh, and it is incumbent upon the current generation of students in combination with our own work to either transform the global energy system and stabilize the climate in the next three decades or not, and that the consequences will last for thousands of generations. So, um, so I guess the premise of the conference is that we need to transition from, from a, a management thinking to a leadership thinking, that, that that's really what we're going to demanding, not only of individuals, but of a whole generation. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on, on that premise. Well, um, even, even, in this, even in that landscape you've laid out, it's, it's, this gets back to some of the things that were said on the preceding panel. Facts still matter, not just facts, but the, the level of uncertainty, the level of unknowable and nobles. Knowing, understanding as well as you can, the, the lay of the land uh, is a premise for having the next steps happen, which are um, being a leader, because you have to know where you want to go. And, and as a journalist studying this arena now for 25 years, and just looking at climate as a sort of a subset of things that are complicated, like extinction, biodiversity, climate is the ultimate multi-spectral thing. Um, if you you have to be able to cut through some of the messaging. Not everybody, even Jim Hansen is, you know, he is one guy. He's, he's an outlier in some aspects of the science of climate change. Uh, the, the rate of sea level rise, when he talks about his definitions of danger, they're not what the, uh, any glaciologist that I know would say is their levels of concern about sea level rise. So, so somewhere in there, the facts still matter. And then you still, so that means you still have to be somehow grounded in how to be a critical um, interpreter of information. And we live in a world now where we're surrounded by information. You, you know, having access to information is not the problem. <laughs> having access to some way to synthesize, to some way to, to, to um, sift, some way to have a, a discussion that's progressive and not just sort of uh, yelling 
is vital. And um, so as a journalist, I've kind of tried to do that by creating a space like a blog. I'm just, it's all an experiment. But I don't know if that's, we don't know monetarily if it'll ever be a way to make money. But, but it is a way to have a conversation that can be not just yelling. And somehow or other, in, in the learning space, in, in schools, I think if there's more of a sense of getting out of your box and not thinking about this transition we're going through, by the way, the next two generations, as just being about the environment. I know this is a meeting about the environment. But the environment, if the definition of that word isn't large enough to include poverty alleviation, uh, well-being, um, health, health issues that all are ultimately environmental in some way or other, uh, then it's then it's also going to fail. So that's one, that's a, kind of a starting point. First of all, I think that um, I, I agree that uh, as an outsider to the discipline um, and as a citizen, so in that sense, I'm typical for most people. There is the first order of business of trying to get clear you know, what are the facts, as best we can know them, what's the diversity of opinion, not only the facts, even there's no consensus, and what is the range of risk and the range of probabilities. Now, this is hazardous business because you're predicting um, a future and, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, there is the expectation, you know, that um, uh, the, the, the unexpected will always happen to some extent. Well, in that context, the things that come to mind about exercising leadership are, one, to, um, to avoid several kinds of unintended things that can happen. One is that nostalgia, that a future generation will consider their own time to be, in some sense, um, deficient. The end of civilization, apocalyptic, kind of religious, pseudo-religious framework in which young people don't grow up with optimism. I mean, I'm not going to repeat sort of the Obama litany of hope. Let's put the word hope on the shelf, you know. Um, now, he's been elected, so now, you know, let's, uh, <laughs> let's forget about that. Um, the, let's, so you, you, want, you want, however, people to think that there is some, that it's not disaster, that the future is not really defined by disaster and by destruction and by all these movies, only I see the trailers, you know, where, you know, gurgling, you know, Empire State Building and, you know, and people will be washed over. Everything that we know and mind treasure, our homes, whatever it is, getting washed away by an apocalypse that's really, um, which makes then us feel, oops, I, I was born too late. 